Right, gentlemen, uh, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Right, good. Uh, I shall be moving now uh, into very much the performance and technical assessment area of TSR2 with regard to certain uh, potential competitor aircraft that were either on the shelf uh, or forth, uh, shortly becoming available potentially off the shelf uh, to the Royal Air Force and particularly to the Royal Australian Air Force from whose evaluation assessment of various types many of the figures within this uh, presentation are drawn. And I will put in the obligatory photograph to begin with. <laughs> and the main aircraft I shall actually consider in terms of uh, potential alternatives to TSR2 are the F4 Phantom, top left, the uh, Dassault Mirage 4, top right, the North American A5 Vigilante on the bottom left, and of course the F111, which the Royal Australian Air Force ended up uh, buying. And the RAF almost did, but then decided otherwise. Throughout this particular presentation, uh, the units, given the nature of the uh, various nations that were involved, apart from the French, uh, and the era in which the aircraft were developed, I will be very much in the imperial area, so I'll express aircraft weight and fuel weight in terms of pounds, and the distance they can fly in nautical miles, apart from a couple of exceptions where statute miles crept in, and maybe I should have converted them, but I didn't for various reasons. And I've got to put in a bit of a warning at the beginning. Uh, if you look in different sources, different references uh, about these aircraft types, you will very, very readily find figures that differ, and sometimes differ quite considerably. I cannot guarantee that the ones I quote are absolutely correct. I have done my best to find the most authoritative source or where several sources agree or closely agree. That suggests there is a degree of... Uh, uh, support between them and they might actually be valid. But aircraft weights can vary and sometimes markedly between different sources. The ranges quoted often vary and for reasons which I'll come to in a moment. And things like fuel volume, you often see gallons referred to but the author does not bother to specify whether they mean US gallons or imperial gallons. Uh, so I had to spend quite a lot of time working out which was which. Aircraft of the same basic type, as they go through development and modification in their lives, you get different marks. For example, the, um, the North American Vigilante going from the A5A to the A5C, considerably different in many ways. So you've got to be very careful when actually considering quoting any performance uh, or dimensional figures for these aircraft types is exactly which one you're referring to. And then when it comes to definitions, this is just a whole tale of woe. What do people actually mean? Ferry range is usually pretty straightforward. How far can you fly an aircraft from A to B? And generally, such flights will be done at altitude for economy. And then you get phrases like combat range. Now, do they mean range or do they mean radius? Obviously, the two are very different. Radius of action is the preferred term. It's not always used. And even when it is used, a figure will often be quoted in terms of miles. But then there is no indication of what profile the aircraft flew. Was it at high altitude? all the way there and all the way back, low outbound, low inbound, or a mixture of the two. The payload, you'll see phrases like the standard weapon load without actually specifying what that standard weapon load is. Is it the maximum the aircraft could lift? This will all make a very big difference in terms of the weight of the aircraft and the drag, particularly for an external uh, stores carriage. And on occasions, you seem to th find aircraft carrying a, an excessive amount of uh, weight, and yet the range figure quoted is that of the ferry range. The two are clearly incompatible. Radius of action, um, sometimes called combat radius, radius, but for the sake of uh, being absolutely clear, it is defined, at least so far as I'm concerned in this presentation, as follows. The maximum distance an aircraft can fly from its base on a given mission profile, in other words, speed and altitude, with a specified load and return, allowing for all safety and operating factors so that when it gets back to its home airfield, it's not running on fumes, it has diversion fuel, it's time to loiter a little bit. And I've always um, quoted uh, figures in this presentation where the aircraft are not given air-to-air -air refueling. And radius of action. Let's go back to the beginning of the 20th century what was then called a modern Zeppelin. Uh, that little red circle is around the German city of Cologne. And the radius of action of the aircraft flying at 
on 50 cent power at a stately 36 knots was actually about 1,000 nautical miles. It gets all the way out to Petrograd, St. Petersburg, gets to Kyiv, gets down almost into uh, the Black Sea, covers all of Italy, much of the Mediterranean, most of Spain, and the whole of the British Isles. And that 1,000 nautical mile radius of action, as I'm sure you know, was fundamental to the original specification that led to TSR2, albeit flying slightly quicker. And by way of contrast, the blue circle was the typical radius of action of a, uh, a fixed-wing aircraft, heavier than air aircraft of the time. You can understand why Zeppelin's airships had a certain vogue. And coming a little further up to date, but post-TSR2, thinking back to the 2011 Libyan campaign, typical radii of action flying from southern Italy out to, say, Tripoli or Benghazi, somewhere around 600 miles, statute miles in this case. And some aircraft range somewhat deeper into Libya, looking for other targets. Tornadoes were tanked to do this. There was actually an aircraft, a multi-role combat aircraft of its time that could do such a mission without air-to-air -air refueling. And it was, of course, the Mosquito, a very fine aircraft. And would TSR-2 have been a modern incarnation? After all, Canberra followed the Mosquito, and TSR-2 was meant to follow Canberra. Anyway, payload and radius of action. Here we have a tornado with a total of 12 1,000 pounders on it. How far could such an aircraft actually fly and get back to its original site? Uh, I think this was done once from Boscombe Down as an experiment. It probably could have bombed a target on Salisbury Plain <laughs> and then staggered back to Boscombe with chest pains. Uh, a meaningless example of a payload on an aircraft. This is utterly um, misleading and irrelevant to any tactical application of a combat aircraft. On the other hand, <clears throat> uh, size matters, and when you come to, say, the V-bombers, and what I think was actually probably the best of the V-bombers, the Handy Page Victor, that had an internal carriage capability of 35 1,000 pounders, and it could fly more than, its radius was more than 2,000 miles with that sort of payload. But that is, of course, the, um, the challenge within aerospace, that as you are pushing for this high payload radius capability, the aircraft inevitably get bigger and inevitably become more expensive. And as I say, payload can be very misleading. This is not the payload, this is the range of weapons that a Phantom could potentially carry, or at least a Phantom of that particular era. I'm not sure which mark of Phantom it is, they all look alike to me. Anybody know? Possibly. The F4C is actually the Phantom that the Australians considered, and I'll come to that. It gets worse than this. <laughs> Intruder, of course. And uh, it's not as though it, this only happens in the West, the Russians do it as well. I'm reliably informed, assuming Google, Google Translate is correct, that this means payload radius. Polozhnaya uh, Nagrushka. But it may be wrong. I could have said, you know, my hovercraft is full of eels in Russian, for all I know. But yeah, weight and reach. And I promise you I'm getting towards the 50s and 60s, but by way of just some uh, demonstrations. Uh, if you look at the, the size of the RAF strategic uh, bombing capability, Lancaster, Lincoln... The Vickers Windsor that didn't make it into uh, service, two prototypes were built, and the, the Washington, the name given to the B-29 Superfortress when it was a bit of a stopgap strategic bomber for the Air Force. And this is how they varied in standard takeoff weight. See that clear increase? Lancaster, the Lincoln essentially is the Lancaster's big brother. The Windsor was a bit bigger, but not much, but the Washington, definitely a league above it. And... When they're all, or each carrying a 14,000 pound payload, the difference in range, not radius, but range in this case, and in statute miles, but it's the comparison between the two that matters, the benefit of that larger aircraft in the form of the Washington with getting on for three times the range with the same payload as the Lancaster is clear. Size matters very much when it comes to such things as payload and radius of action. And plotting them on a graph between the range and the operating weight, you see that near linear direct proportion between the weight and the range for a given payload. Very, very strong correlation between the two. 
And this applies with more modern aircraft as well, well, relatively more modern. Uh, Skyhawk top left, AV-8B Harrier top right, AV-8A, the original Harrier in the middle on the left, the A7 Corsair, and the North American Vigilante looking very svelte in the bottom right photograph. Nice looking aircraft, I think. And again, if you look at their weight and distance, combat radius, nautical miles on the x-axis, and their uh, maximum take of weight in thousands of pounds on the, uh, on the y-axis, the Skyhawk Corsair and Vigilante again exhibit that clear straight line radius between their weight and how far they can go. Now, the two Harriers, of course, they have certain handicaps given the compromise in design and build uh, for their V-stall performance, so they don't accord to that same rule. And with two points on a graph, of course, you can always draw a straight line through them. I'm not suggesting that that would necessarily extrapolate to the right if you were to build an AV-8C and then an AV-8D of increasing size and weight. Now, the difference in fuel burn between flying at low level and high, high altitude is very significant indeed. And this can be illustrated by comparing uh, a Phantom, in this case the F4J, which the RAF used as an interim model after the Falklands for a while, flying either a low-low sortie or a high-high sortie with exactly the same stores fit. Six 500-pound bombs and two 370 US gallon tanks. And at high altitude, the radius of action is more than double that achieved at low level. So the demands on an aircraft such as TSR2 and the low level radius of action was some 700 nautical miles, at least I think that was a specified requirement, whether it ever achieved that, I don't know. Um, to achieve that at low level is, of course, extremely demanding. And a little more on the issue of size, comparing the F-16 and the F-15, each carrying the same amount of uh, stores to 1,000 pound JDAMs, although their tank fit is different. And as the stores fit increases to four JDAMs and then six JDAMs, you can see the advantage of that larger aircraft in the form of the F-15E Strike Eagle progressively increases as the mission profile becomes more challenging for that greater payload. And in fact, that advantage goes from about one and a half times the radius to one and, one and two thirds, and then ultimately to about almost two and a half. And this is what would have driven the sheer size of TSR2, and I will eventually come, I promise, to considering how big it was compared to its competitors. And as you have seen for yourself, as I'm sure you've visited Cosford before, it is a very big aircraft. It is considerably larger than a Tornado, for example. And a few further comparisons, Canberra, TSR2, and the Vulcan and the Victor. Clearly, the V-bombers are a size division above that of TSR2 in terms of empty weight. And in terms of payload and their radius of action, again, considerably more so. And they would have been considered, of course, the strategic arm of uh, the Royal Air Force at the time. And you have that tactical designation for TSR2. Even though it still had considerable reach in the form of uh, its typical internal payload of 6,000 pounds. And should, in theory at least, uh, with a typical high-low, low-high mission profile, have achieved a radius of action of more than 1,100 nautical miles potentially. And that was the, the basic requirement, that it could cruise at sea level at Mark 0.9, but could also get up to supersonic speed, Mark 1.1, that it could get to Mark 2, or just over it at altitude. And for a 2,000-pound internal payload, which would have been a nuclear weapon, on internal fuel only, a, a, a radius of action of 1,000 nautical miles or 1,500 if it was allowed to carry external tanks, drop tanks, under wing. Very demanding. And as I mentioned, that subsonic, at low level, 700 nautical mile radius of action, or if it was going to do a supersonic dash, that Mark 1.1, with drop tanks, it would be able still to get to that 700 nautical mile reach. <laughs> 
It also had to meet a ferry range of around 3,000 nautical miles, a takeoff run, pretty short, 3,000 to 4,500 feet, depending on the payload, of course, the takeoff weight, from a semi prepared or low grade aircraft operating surface. Yet another very challenging demand in the specification that this was an aircraft which other nations would have built to operate from a long concrete runway, and we were trying to make it operate essentially from firm grasp. Oh, sorry, firm grass. That sort of aircraft operating from a grass strip, it really doesn't seem particularly feasible or compatible with what you might call real world operating circumstances. And it was able to achieve the very high, very demanding radii of action uh, specified requirements through an absolutely massive fuel load. The internal tankage alone, 5,588 imperial gallons, 45,000 pounds. Bear in mind that a Spitfire's, uh, well at least the early Spitfire's, their internal uh, fuel volume was 85 imperial gallons, which puts it in perspective. And 45,000 uh, pounds, that is more than say a Buccaneer's empty weight. And external, two 450-gallon imperial, imperial gallon tanks, some 7,000 pounds more fuel. You could put a tank in the bomb bay, another 4,600 pounds. A 1,000-gallon ventral tank, which obviously precluded the use of the bay, but it still had underwing uh, hard points. Another 8,000 pounds for a total of over 8,000 imperial gallons, 65,000 pounds of fuel, 29 tonnes of fuel. Absolutely massive potential fuel load. Now, the required mission profile for the high, low, low, high for that 1,000 nautical miles radius of action went as follows. Climb to about 25,000 feet. Outbound crews gradually climbing as the fuel burnt off and the aircraft got lighter at Mark 0.92, out to a bit beyond 600 miles. Then a rapid climb to just under 50,000 feet, that's probably about 48 or so, and a supersonic leg getting out towards 800 nautical miles from base, followed by a maximum rate descent. That leg would have been flown at about Mark 1.7, not Mark 2. And had the uh, maximum speed been specified to Mark 1.7, that would have made life rather easier, and the aircraft would still probably have been effective. The Mark 2 requirement was uh, even more demanding. And then the inbound and outbound low level, 200 feet or so, at Mark 0.9. And then the return, following a slightly different profile, but similar speeds. And that was the, the basic requirement for that nuclear strike role. High level outbound, descend to low level, high speed at low level, high transonic, and then return. Now the Royal Australian Air Force wished to replace their cameras as well. And they considered the following aircraft, the Phantom F-4C, the Dassault Mirage 4A, the North American Vigilante in its RA-5C form, what was then called the TFX, it became the F-111 and for the Australians F-111C, and TSR-2. I've also put in the details of the, the Buccaneer as a, an aircraft in UK service at the time, at least with the uh, Royal Navy, and of course it uh, was eventually adopted by the Royal Air Force as well. The Phantom, as I said, initially developed as a fleet carrier-launched interceptor, but it turned out to have fighter-bomber capabilities and became an extremely effective aircraft, serving with not only the Navy, but the Marine Corps, the United States Air Force, and, of course, many export customers. There we have the Buccaneer. It had an internal bomb bay, but it was not much used for quite a lot of its RAF service. Here, it's seen carrying four Sea Eagles under wing. They used to operate in uh, packages of four to fly against the crest class cruisers of the Soviet Navy so that they could have 16 missiles incoming on the cruiser at any one time, which essentially would have swamped its defences. When that role was taken by the Tornado, the Tornado could only carry two Sea Eagles, so the obvious requirement was to have eight Tornadoes flying this particular anti-crester mission. 
Um, the Air Force decided it couldn't afford this, so it said, four's enough. Suddenly, magically, where previously you needed 16 missiles, eight were deemed sufficient because they'd suddenly become twice as effective. This is the way the Air Force works. I work for them, I know. Right, the French. Uh, stepping back from the screen in slight horror at the thought of a French aircraft in RAF service. Uh, yeah, the Mirage 4, I built specifically for the delivery of the French airborne nuclear deterrent. Looks extremely like a Mirage 3, the same classic Dassault um, Delta uh, platform. And just to make that point, you have a Mirage 3 next to the Mirage 4A. Almost indistinguishable. If you were to see a uh, Mirage 4 at, at a glance, you'd probably, and I certainly would, think it was a 3, unless you started looking very closely and noted the tandem cockpits and the fact it has two engines as opposed to the single for the Mirage 3. Of course, the Mirage uh, 4 was different. It was not a carrier aircraft, and it was not originally designed to fly at low level. The Buccaneer was, and obviously TSR-2 was as well, as was the F-111. And so it was relatively lightly built. How are we doing for time? Oh, not too bad. The North American Vigilante, again, a carrier-based aircraft, so it had to be built to withstand the shocks of uh, catapult takeoff and arrested landing. And in terms of its general arrangement, really quite similar to TSR-2. Slightly tubbier, slightly wider, because its uh, bomb bay was actually between the, the two engines and intake ducts, uh, whereas the TSR-2, the bay was beneath that particular part of the engine arrangement system. High wing, relatively small wings uh, for the weight of the aircraft, so high lift devices and blowing and so forth was uh, essential. But very, very similar in general terms. And the Bombay for the Vigilante is interesting. Uh, that is the port jet pipe. And then the bay actually exited not downwards but rearwards. And so you had a tail cone and a tunnel running forwards between the two engines in which there was a store train, which could be three fuel tanks or two fuel tanks and a Mark 28 bomb which is a nuclear weapon, and so you had the, the bomb at the front, and then two fuel tanks. Or you could have the entire bay filled with three tanks and carry your stores under wing, or potentially on the center line as well. An interesting concept, and one that really never found favor. The aircraft actually ended up mainly in the reconnaissance role, with fuel in the uh, longitudinal bay between the two uh, two engines, and if it carried stores at all, it was almost certainly under wing. And, of course, North American did the same thing. TSR-2. The sheer size of the aircraft is indicated, not that I have to tell you, uh, by the scale of the people standing beneath the tailplane. Very large aircraft indeed, comparable in size, somewhat larger, if anything, and a little heavier, than the F-111. Note the similarity between the intakes on TSR-2 and the Mirage 4, semicircular, uh, offset from the side of the aircraft to avoid the, the boundary layer, and with that conical, movable conical um, device to actually control the shockwave uh, within the intake itself. You've got a transverse shockwave generated at the tip of the cone, and then a perpendicular shockwave around the lip of the intake itself. So very similar intake design. Now, the Royal Australian Air Force requirement was a little less demanding than that of the Royal Air Force for OR339. The radius of action required was a minimum of 900 nautical miles, including a section at very low level, quote, but that was about 200 feet, but a desirable radius of 1,100 nautical miles with a slightly greater very low level requirement or low level flight. The weapon load either six 1,000-pound bombs, and TSR-2 could carry that internally, or two air-to-surface missiles. And the example that the Australians used was the American air-to-surface bullpup. And all of these figures come from the 1963 uh, report. This is there of the evaluation team on the strike reconnaissance aircraft for the RAAF. I'm indebted to Chris Gibson, who's in the audience, for supplying me with that particular report. Very similar to TSR-2, a requirement for Mark II at high level, 50,000 feet, 
high subsonic speed at low level, and the ability to accelerate to supersonic, but probably only about Mark 1.1 again, at low level for short distances. It would be a short distance, otherwise you would simply run out of fuel. And now comparing the aircraft's empty weight. How did they compare? And it's notable just how different they were. The Phantom, substantial aircraft in itself, is very much the small lightweight case within this set, within this group of contenders. A little bit lighter than a Buccaneer. The Mirage 4, which was quite a bit bigger in some respects, but as I say, quite lightly built, so it's empty weight, it's not much greater than a Buccaneer. And then they start going up the scale. The A5 Charlie, getting on for 38,000 pounds, the F111, and then the aircraft with the greatest empty weight was actually TSR2. Now, I bet you could find figures for most, if not all, of those aircraft which would differ from these. And in their own context, they may well be correct. But I think these are at least consistent and coherent within the context of the study that I did and the presentation I compiled. The maximum takeoff weights, tending along the same trend line, although the F-111, in this case, so far as the Australians were concerned, actually had the higher max takeoff weight, but it also acknowledged that there was a higher potential takeoff weight for the TSR2 of getting up to maybe as much as 130,000 pounds as the aircraft was developed. When they did this study, neither the F-111 nor TSR2 had actually flown. So all of the figures were either estimates or fairly early examples of whatever studies had been carried out by the manufacturers. The other aircraft, of course, were reasonably well established. Look then at the internal fuel of those aircraft types. And once again, they follow the original line of the empty weight graph. The TSR2 well out in front, that 5,588 imperial gallons, 45,000 pounds. The Mirage does very well. It has pr pretty much exactly the same amount of fuel as the Vigilante, even though it's a rather lighter aircraft. But it's not particularly smaller. It's just lightly built, as I say. And the Phantom and the Buccaneer, considerably, considerably less. But an interesting comparison is that of fuel fraction. How much did the fuel weigh in comparison to the aircraft itself? So if you take the internal fuel and the empty weight and add them together, and then divide that in to the internal fuel weight on its own, you get, that, you get a proportional figure. And you can see again, the larger aircraft tend to come out ahead, although the Mirage 4 does particularly well because of its low empty weight. But size again matters. You get a better fuel fraction on internal fuel with the larger aircraft. Inevitably, they go further. They are far more likely to meet the demanding requirements of radius of action of both the Royal Australian Air Force and, for that matter, the Royal Air Force. And just comparing them relative to TSR2, as you can see, <coughs> the Mirage does very well, and the Vigilante and the F-111, pretty similar, but a little bit down. Now, the figures that the Australians compiled for the Mirage 4, carrying two air-to-surface missiles, but when the aircraft was equipped with its standard 572 Imperial Gallon drop tanks, it had a radius of action 850 nautical miles. In other words, it fell short of that minimum of 900. Dasso proposed that they could fit two 1100 gallon tanks and that that would push the radius of action above the 900 minimum. Just note how much more fuel you need carried externally to get that extra 95 miles. And that radius would have been only achieved by dropping the tanks once they're empty to reduce your drag. So you'd be throwing your tanks away every time, and drop tanks of that size are not cheap. This is not like the paper tanks that the Mustang used. The Vigilante, uh, it was assessed in the sense of carrying two underwing air-to-surface missiles, two bullpups, and two underwing fuel tanks. Keeping the tanks, the red line, it could get to 700 miles. Jettisoning the tanks, it get to 835. Again, just short of that 900 figure. On the other hand, if you fitted four tanks and carried the missiles on the center line and you jettisoned the tanks, it comfortably exceeded the 900 nautical mile radius minimum and, in fact, was getting towards that desirable 1100. 
So the vigilante actually did pretty well in the Australian assessment. As I said, neither of these aircraft had flown, so they had to be assessed in, should we say, academic terms. And the report concluded, it appears that the TSR-2 could provide the desirable 1,100 nautical mile radius. And then said, it might get as far as 1,600 if the max takeoff weight could be raised to 130,000 and 800 pounds. Uh, personally, I find that a little optimistic, but it probably would have exceeded the 1,100 quite comfortably. The F-111, again, an estimate and a, a radius around 1,150 nautical miles, but by reducing the high-speed dash at low level from supersonic to subsonic, again, they thought they could get out to about 1,600 nautical miles. Probably optimistic again, even without the excessive fuel burn at supersonic speed, but the F-111 certainly had major drag problems, and did it ever really achieve its uh, original brochure radius of action? Yeah, I think it generally fell short of that. But the figures the Australians used in their overall assessment was the Phantom at 627, the Buccaneer, this comes from another source, as I said, they didn't consider the Buccaneer, 750, the Mirage, 850, the Vigilante, just over 1,000, TSR-2, 1,100, and just pipping it, 11,000, uh, 11,000, 1,150 nautical miles by the TFX, the F-111. So the three largest aircraft clearly um, substantially out ahead. And the Australian assessment continued. They considered the F-111 as definitely superior to TSR-2 particularly with regard to the following parameters. The range, even though that radius of action advantage by the F-111 was not that great. They considered it a better candidate in terms of the short takeoff and landing capability. This may have been based on the fact that it has variable geometry, swing wings. The TSR-2, of course, did not. Weapons carriage, total weapons carriage, not just internal. The reconnaissance capability, that would have presumably been based on an assessment of the maturity and the potential performance of the sensors and data processing systems that the aircraft had, but particularly the cost. There were con great concerns about the rising cost of TSR-2 and the belief that those costs would only increase further. Of course, the F-111 costs increased considerably. The aircraft eventually cost the Australians something like double what they originally thought it would be, and it was also many years late. But at the time, they were very confident about the F-111. Despite the fact they liked the F-111 so much, they also recognised it was at a very early stage compared to aircraft such as the Vigilante. So you could see that re-equipping the RAAF with the F-111 would be good, but it would also delay the effectiveness of a, as they say, a credible deterrent until the early 70s at best. They saw the Vigilante as being a quicker and a highly effective means of providing that uh, capability in strike and reconnaissance. So they recognised it wasn't the best aircraft, or at least potentially the best aircraft, but it was the best available one. Now, of course, TSR-2 could have gone further. This is a photograph of a model, not the real thing, but a TSR-2 with a tank in the bay, the 1,000-gallon ventral tank, and carrying a couple of Blue water air-to-surface missiles, these have been nuclear-tipped, and a couple of anti-radiation anti missiles, anti-radar missiles, in the form of two Martels. And they would have had that much fuel, over 7,000 gallons, and on a high-low, high, high-low-low-high high, high, high mission profile, estimated it would have a radius of action of greater than 1,500 nautical miles. Huge fuel load, external weapons, but obviously the weapons would be uh, used and they would not have experienced their drag on the return. They might have retained the Martels. That uh, blue water nuclear missile didn't actually have much of a standoff range, so the aircraft was still approaching its target to fairly close quarters. However, that would never be. On the other hand, 
The Buccaneer was subject to a series of potential upgrades proposed by Blackburn, BAC, and generally the Air Ministry were not particularly keen. The standard Buccaneer, and here is a classic example of maximum strike range with external fuel with a normal weapon load, neither specified, but claimed to be about 2,000 nautical miles, a 1,000 nautical mile radius, and that's probably for a high altitude profile. Or a combat radius with full weapons load, 600 miles. What's full weapons load? The source didn't specify. But Blackburn did propose in 1965 the Buccaneer Two Star, which was still going to be transonic, but would have terrain following radar, ground mapping radar, moving in the direction of the TSR2 uh, avionic capability. That was not taken up. 1968, the Buccaneer P150. The air staff, with their usual um, desire, that you might almost say obsession with having supersonic performance in its aircraft, wanted the space in the Buccaneer reheated. Uh, the aircraft would have got bigger and heavier. The intakes would have been variable geometry, rather similar to the TSR2 and Mirage 4 types. We've had thrust reverses, that uh, Coke bottle uh, area ruling, uh, contraction and bulge would have been uh, essentially uh, would have been absorbed into the uh, fuselage extension. New tail, new main, new main wheels, and they proposed it could have reached Mark 1.8. Personally, I don't think that would have been useful. I think the reheat would have been far better just in terms of improving the aircraft's field performance. But that is a general arrangement. You can see the, the wider jet pipes for the reheat, the, the bogey undercarriage in place of the original single wheel uh, aircraft, uh, single wheel undercarriage for the uh, deck landings, and the longer, rather slimmer fuselage. And I think a more credible proposal was the P145 of 1966, where it was claimed by Blackburn that it would have a 100% increase in the weapon load, a 40% increase in the radius, that would have been useful, and a 33% reduction in the takeoff run. Two rocket boosters were going to be fitted in the rear fuselage. This was done for the Buccaneer with the version exported to the South Africans. And their radius, with a 4,000 pound payload, which probably would have been internal, was 1,250 nautical miles. Infuriatingly, though, the source from which these figures come did not specify the mission profile. And I would not wish to hazard a guess. But the Buccaneer had great potential that, unfortunately, was not fulfilled. Instead, interest turned following the F-111K to the Anglo-French Variable Geometry Aircraft, AFVG, before that was cancelled. But in terms of size and general design, extremely similar to Tornado, apart from the intakes. And so we have the eventual decision by the Australians to purchase the F-111. Despite its delays and cost rises, it then served long and apparently well with the Australians, as indeed with the uh, United States Air Force. Once its many drawbacks were overcome, and instead we have to wait all, all those many years until finally Tornado, multi-role combat aircraft, went into service in late 1982, I think. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But what could TSR2 have been? It was such a challenging project, such a very, very demanding set of uh, design requirements, performance parameters, uh, the incompatibility, incompatibility of, say, rough field performance with an aircraft of this size, the complexity of the undercarriage, the fact that everything about it was new, new airframe, new engines, new avionics. It was almost um, just tempting fate to embark on such an ambitious project. Maybe an 80% solution of the original specification would have produced an aircraft that was much, much more affordable and achievable in much less time. Had that been the case, it may well have served for several decades. We essentially supplanted Tornado, but that is obviously speculation. And it's now lunchtime. That's it. <laughs>